All right, everybody. This is Buzzkill. My name is Hunter Willis, and with me I've got Jay Leesk, my co-host for this podcast. Thanks for everybody for joining today. Today we're talking about governance, and this is Buzzkill episode four, and we're both excited to jump into this with you. Jay's laughing right now because he hates this announcer voice, but I'm excited to get going also so that I can switch back into my normal voice. And yes, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to toss it over to him, Jay Leesk. <laughs> No, uh, it is always a pleasure to talk with you, even when you do that weird voice that you do. Bring you bring a lot of excitement, and and this is a topic that probably needs that because nobody actually wants to talk about governance. What they want to talk about is a system that works successfully, that balances control and accessibility and collaboration, uh, um, that meets the regulations that organizations have, but they don't actually want to talk about how you get there. And, and it's not easy. Um, traditionally, IT had this roll out the tool and walk away, and, and that doesn't work, just like my microphone when I'm that far away. You, you really need to have a strategy for making sure the tool is successful. And in doing that, you need to have a strategy for how you're going to control the technology, how you're going to make sure that while you secure your content, your data, you're not inhibiting people's ability to do their job. Doesn't sound like a very fun conversation. So in that sense, your announcer voice is a great way to start. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And this is, you know, the reason we're calling again this uh, this podcast Buzzkill is that, uh, like Jay said, it's like, well, everybody wants the end result. But like when you start really talking about the ways that, you know, there's there's kind of this theory of like all the things that we should be doing. And then there's like, well, look, when we get into the nitty gritty details of how that you know, all the things that you have to work through in order to get to that end result, it starts looking like a lot of hard work. And, yeah. it, you know, it is a lot of hard work and nobody's saying it's not, but it doesn't have to be this, you know, crazy thing that never gets done and that you always, you know, got looming over your head and it's never going to end for one part. And the second part is that the thing about governance when we're talking about IT systems and strategy it's and how an organization goes end. forward. Governance is kind of, you know, it is a buzzword, right? But it's this all-encompassing term for a lot of different things that are happening on platforms, environments. Um, and we're focusing on the way that teams are, like, collaborating in, you know, collaboration software systems, especially in the cloud, like Office 365, like G Suite, like Dropbox and things like this. So um, the point is that if you don't have governance you're going to have to clean up a lot of stuff later, right? And that's not just talking about like end of life cycle for content. It's also talking about security and, you know, access permissions as well as content structure and the way things look and work and how teams collaborate, you know, yeah. um, efficiency for search terms, you know, people understanding where things are and how to use different applications. These are all things that can be made way easier for the end user and reduce time and burden for management for IT teams moving down the road, right? Yeah, it's interesting. I was having a conversation today actually with one of our prospects uh, about their team's rollout. And, um, you know, we, we I, I talk a lot about teams in, in the other podcast, uh, This Week in Teams, aptly named. Um, you know, Microsoft Teams has seen a massive spike in usage over the last three, four months now. And, and the reason is people are working from home and it enables them to do that. It enables them to collaborate much more easily. It enables them to share information more, more easily. So a lot of organizations, what they've done is uh, they've just turned it on and they've given people access to it and they've said, go have at it. You know, we don't really have a lot of choice because we have to do this super quickly. And in the conversation I was having this morning, you know, the, the customer I was speaking with said specifically, you know, we had one group who wasn't happy about what we were doing. It was the SharePoint admins because SharePoint admins have seen with SharePoint what happens when you don't have governance in place of your system. The sprawl that you get, the duplication of workspaces that you get, um, the lack of cleanup, it never happens. And for years, you and I talked about this last week. Um, you know, you you had two scenarios for migration. Either you fully analyzed your content and only migrated the good stuff, or you from platform to platform just took the whole thing and dropped it in the new solution. And 
and what we've seen from a SharePoint from a SharePoint world is just year after year, there's no cleanup. There's no deletion of old spaces. There's very little happening to make sure that doesn't happen. And with Teams, where it's even easier to create workspace, and it's in fact more encouraged to create these workspaces, without some kind of a governance plan, you, you're you gonna have a problem eventually. Not in day one, not even in you know day 90 or 120, but one day you're gonna look at your system and just go, what just happened? Like, where did all of this come from? And what's it even being used for? And in a world where open collaboration means access to your data, now we have a question of data security and data integrity. Um, so governance, really the, the, the whole purpose of having a governance process and a governance plan is to make sure that, that you don't run into that position. The other team that was really unhappy about the plan that this customer went with was their cybersecurity group. Without any kind of governance play, the, that whole data security concept is just, it's gone. Um, and you have to come back to that. So when you are coming back to that, when you are starting to think about that, um, you know, the, the goal of this conversation here today is, is how do you do that? How do you right size that ship once you have opened opened the you know the doors and let everyone in um uh, and following from that theme you know two episodes ago we talked about uh COVID-19 and everyone working from home last episode we started talking about the whole concept of migration and how do you start to right size from a content perspective the goal here today is how do you right size from a controls and governance perspective and make sure that you have a path to success going forward yeah, so getting started diving into this conversation, um, we we want to talk about like where do you get started with this, right? And and right now talking about the current landscape with COVID, from what we're seeing from a lot of our uh, the people that we talk to in the industry, um, not only the people that we work with through our jobs, but also peers and you know things that we see people talking about on social media, etc. Um, we we gave the advice uh, the last time we had a conversation about um thank you got my coffee it's great <laughs> see having a plan right i had my i like it my spouse bring me coffee very thankful mm. <sighs> anyway um so we we wanted to get uh we gave people the advice of getting the documentation whatever documentation they can right take some notes as mm -hmm. far as you know where the content that you're getting into your systems is going what you migrated how it was what your plan was right so that you've right. got some kind of a starting point. And everyone has some sort of a knowledge, at least an entry level knowledge of where data is, how things are structured in their collaboration platforms from a management perspective, or at least can do a high level audit, you know, study the environment a little bit, have a few conversations to get a big picture of that. So the starting point, right, really is to First, assess what you do know from those notes and from what you can ascertain by doing a high level, just kind of a 10,000 foot view of the environment, see what's going on. And right. then to really get into identifying business needs and requirements. And again, this could involve uh, a lot of conversations with users or it could involve just, you know, policies from your organization or how things are being done, you know, for conversations that you've had. But definitely suggest... Um, having as many conversations with stakeholders and users as you can look at your it tickets and the conversations that your help desk teams are having with users um, that it is having with the organization and start to determine hey what are the areas that we need to focus on where are people having the most trouble you know right. and also um, take a look at the way that collaboration is happening in this ad hoc environment start to contrast that with these problems right because uh, most of these organizations that we're talking about, a lot of the people that we've had conversations with to one level or another, they've just kind of turned on teams or their collaboration platform and tried to get people going as quickly as possible. But they're encountering, encountering a lot of problems with that. Right, Jay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's interesting. So we do a lot of governance advisory services for 
for customers who are looking at Microsoft and moving to that collaborative space. And when we do that, uh, just going back through what you said, right, review your documentation. The very first thing we do is we ask for any input you can give us uh, that helps us understand what processes have you gone through to try and do this already? Um, what do you have a governance plan? Great. Let's review it. Uh, have you had a consultant come in and talk about information architecture. Great. Let's look at that plan. Um, what technology are you using? Let's let's go there and then compare that with. Oh, and frankly, what's your data look like? We the first thing we do is we run a scan of your environment and we look at your data just from a, a basic outlay of it. How many how many workspaces do you have? How old are those workspaces? How active are they? How big are they? Then we start to compare that with the end user experience. What roadblocks are you as a person having to being successful to meet your mission or business requirements? Um, what would help you be more successful? And I don't mean this box being green would help me be more successful. I just mean, conceptually speaking, when you go into the office, what is the task you dread doing? Um, and, and how can we start to improve that? These are the kinds of things that as we're as we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we move forward? help us define what that path needs to be. And that absolutely lines all of that up. Um, we usually do, uh, if, you're, if you're listening to this going, well, geez, how do, I, how do I ask my stakeholders what's going on, right? We usually do one to two weeks of planned workshops and we go heavy on them. You know, three to four hours a piece, bring in representatives from across the business, not just one business unit, not just the C-suite, um, but we try and, and and hit all of these different spaces and try and showcase really like what what problems are you hearing from your organizations so that we can start documenting the types of things that help us be all that. Now you got to look at, well, what what kind of regulations do we need to be yep. considering? Um, because you know what? the we're we're trying to fix things. Let's actually consider. <laughs> from a regulatory perspective, what, what do we need to fix? Yeah. And that's, you know, regardless of whether or not you're in a regulated industry, uh, you know, where this is kind of a self-evident thing, like healthcare, you know, or like government contractors, um, you know, accounting firms, things like this, even if you're in private industry, you know, you still may have personal, uh, identifying information in your environment, uh, financial right. information that's regulated, you know, and you've, like, for instance, if you're holding credit card numbers, there is a standard of security that must be um, uh, attained, you know, that you've got to maintain for that data, um, especially if that's like in a database somewhere, but it doesn't exclude being inside of a document in your environment if it's a customer credit card number. So um, you got to be very, very careful with that information and understand where it may exist in your environment. And in order to do that, again, it, ha it has to go through these conversations, looking at your processes. And it's not just about, and one of the reasons that governance is such a big encompassing term, right? Not just about the data in the platform. It's also about the processes that your users are going through as they work, right? What's their mentality yeah. towards things? Are there some cultural changes you may have to make? You know, are there some managers saying, well, ah, this isn't a big deal. It's the way we've always done it. You have to come in there and be like, look, you know, that's that may be the case. However, it's always been done very improperly and we're, we've got huge liabilities associated with this. Right. Yeah. So, frankly, if, if you want to combat the it's the way we've always done it problem, reviewing what you have and reviewing with your end users how they are successful and how they aren't is the first thing that you can do to make sure that you get through that problem. Um, You'll notice, uh, Hunter, <laughs> clearly, but listener, you'll notice that we haven't talked about the tech yet. We haven't talked about the capabilities of the tech that you own or the tech that you're looking at buying. Um, yes, that needs to be part of your solution, clearly. But really, like if you start there, then you're going to go into those other con conversations with preconceived notions of what's possible and what's not. And when someone tells you that they have this problem or this roadblock in their life, in their uh, ability to accomplish their mission, you're immediately going to go, well, why aren't you using this tech instead of listening and, and, and understanding? Um, 
this is where you start to look at the technology. So you've looked at what you have from an inventory perspective. You looked at what what problems your end users are having, um, where they're successful, where they're not. Now you start to look at, okay, the tech, the available tech we have, the available solutions we can put out today include this capabilities. Yeah, and this is coming from people that work for a software company, right? We're telling you, don't look at the software first, Mm -hmm. right? The reason, you know, good software will match your business use cases. Start with the business use cases. Start with how people are collaborating. Because the only, you know, there's no software that can mitigate every single problem. And we said this earlier, right? We talked about um, how, you know, with risk, uh, it's it's not about completely eliminating risk. It's about reducing risk because there's no catch-all for every single scenario that can possibly exist. But... You know, having your users understand the what and the why, what's in it for them about how they collaborate and um, getting them ways to do things really easily so that they don't go off onto, you know, um, their own solutions. We'll talk about this here in a minute, but like making sure that it's easy for them to do things the way that they should within your platforms is very, very important, which, again, is why you've got to understand before you come to them with some kind of a application or solution pro, uh, fix for um, a problem that you're having or to meet security requirements, you really got to understand um, how they are collaborating, you know, what's going on with, you know, the way that they're, they're interacting, they're working with each other. What do the requirements of the business have to do with the way that people are scaling um, the, the content, you know? So, it's to say that you've got to strategize. You've got to get in there. You've got to look at and do keep in mind what your platforms are capable of, but have a, a strategy to solve the problems before you go look at the software. Then look at your software, look at your requirements of your users and start to understand, okay, what can you do with the software? Where yeah. are there maybe like some software has capabilities to do things, but in order for that to work properly, you have to get every single user in the organization to manually tag stuff with metadata, for instance. That is not necessarily, yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Immediate (laughs) eye rolls. Not really, uh, you know, then you have to like look into training them. It's not foolproof because the second somebody doesn't do the right thing, then the thing breaks, doesn't work properly. Uh, That's right. You're creating for the risk, right? So what can be automated? How can it be automated in a way that's really easy for the end users to interact with it? And what capabilities are out there and where might you need to bring in a third party solution in order to maybe um, add functionality or simplify your workload or maybe even both when it comes to these processes, right? Yeah. So, Hunter, let me let me let me ask you a question. When you're looking at the technology and you're trying to decide how does it meet our requirements, what are some of the key areas that you're focused on? Um, what are some of the the primary things that you think are the that our listeners should be considering when it comes to governance and controls? Well, it's easy, you know, in the classic way to approach software purchasing software, looking at software for uh, situations like this. Um, and again, Jay and I heavily biased. We work for a software company that is. Apple. I am not. Obviously, we would be like, yeah, hey, buy a point for everything. Right. But sure, sure. generally, like coming out from a nor- more neutral standpoint, it really is important that you don't just approach the situation with a list of requirements that you've got to check off as a checkbox and then buy software that meets that requirements, because there's a lot of software companies out there that say they do a thing, but when you actually test it or look at the way that they do the thing, there's a lot of like workarounds and it's built in kind of a funky way, or maybe the GUI hasn't been updated in several years. And so it's kind of like, you know, you might wind up with buggy software, right? Then there's questions like, is it SaaS? Or are you having to download it and maintain your own servers, adding maintenance time to what's going on as well as, you know, you've got a security requirements for those servers. And then the additional workload of that. And then on top of that, right, you've got to look at if it is SaaS, is it a reputable organization? Is it just like an app that's only in one cloud instance? Or has the software been around for quite a long time? Is it a reputable organization? What kind of security uh, certifications does the organization itself have? And then the other thing is that as much as you can, there are, and you'll notice this as you're looking, there's... 
larger software companies that have been around for a long time ha seem to have many more all-encompassing solutions that you can save a lot of value with and meet more of your use cases with if you're looking at it like that. Instead of going out and buying what we call microservices where you're going around and buying 15 different apps to solve a lot of different problems, right? And as you're asking your end users how they're collaborating, what they're doing, ask them if they've bought any apps to do these things because there may be some things that you can bring to the table yes. and make it so that the users have fewer applications on top of what's out there. And you might even find that users are paying for, and this is very, very common, paying for applications, right? where you've already got apps for them to use, like Office 365 has like all these different applications, G Suite, Dropbox have a lot of different functionalities and free or like freemium integrations that are not very expensive. They may be using other applications and duplicating functionality that your organization is already paying for. And one simple training could get them off those applications and get them going, right? So the other thing is that you don't want what you don't want is 15 different kinds of security software that you're using to maintain one or two or three collaboration systems on top of all, you know, most organizations are still got some kind of server virtualization going on, you know, yeah. maintaining databases and all these other things, web applications, external facing applications and stuff like that. It's, it's a, it becomes a lot very, very quickly. You don't need apps on top of your apps on top of your apps. So the more that you can bring things all as an all in one solution, the better and the more reputable the company, the better. Look for use cases. And the last thing I'd say too is that there are a lot of, what I'm seeing a lot of in the industry right now, a lot of services firms are coming out with applications. Yeah. And when you look at a services firm with an application, number one, they're not a software development company, they're a services firm. And the applications that they're developing, even though they're an enterprise company, they look like they have a lot of case studies the applications that they're developing a lot of times are still kind of in a beta form, what we would call their, you know, maybe kind of buggy, may not have actually, even though they have case studies from different organizations, that's their services side. The actual, you know, application itself may not have been used very much. So, you know, not saying don't buy from a company like that, but you definitely want to consider the security of it, how reliable it's going to be how long they're planning on maintaining that and looking at the pricing model and what that could look like in the future because those companies are going to have to adopt adapt as those software the, you know the software that they develop grows as their organization grows so like there's going to be a lot of comp a lot of changes involved with that from how it's deployed to maintaining security to you know looking at their pricing model etc so um, man next time next time i set you up with a question i'm going to make sure i give you better guidelines do you you're yeah, right so no you're, you're absolutely, you went down a tangent I didn't expect, which was how do you evaluate the, the, the specific vendor, um, which are really good questions. Um, but that's like uh, asking a, a plastic surgeon, you know, how can I improve my face? Um, <laughs> but you're beautiful, but you're Jay, right. don't touch a thing. But you're right in the sense that, um, you know, you have to start considering what's best for our organization. Is it better to have an enterprise solution, which meets the 80 to 90% case, and then bring in a little bit here and there to, to fill those gaps? Or is it better to have uh, individual point solutions to build that stack up ourselves? And it really, it depends on what you're trying to do and, and what, your, what your base goal is, right? Um, I meant more on the governance side, like what are the considerations for governance you should have? Um, and, 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 you know, I'm generally thinking like, uh, when we have governance of a collaboration solution, we're looking at how do I create the workspaces? How do I manage them over time? How do I, uh, you know, what kind of, um, uh, disposal or end of life process do I have for it? Um, and, and that's, <laughs> that's what I was expecting you to answer with. <laughs> so, yeah, uh thoughts <laughs> yeah no that's definitely accurate right so it, the question is so looking at the definition of governance right um i did get kind of into like a nuts and bolts conversation not like a strategy sorry about that so but it's true and all the things i said hold up you know and it's i think that, that they no, are important absolutely. to consider so i'm glad i'm glad i went on that tangent you no know, but um but really looking at 
you know, the capabilities of the software in regards to governance and how much it can it can do for other requirements that you may have, right? Um, so l looking at when it comes to like controlling provisioning, looking at what it what its capabilities are as far as like access and who can access what kind of documents as well as, you know, what can it bring to the table as far as exposure goes, you know, not just necessarily permissions and access, but like there's other sharing uh, sharing capabilities that exist inside some of these platforms too. So, you know, are there kind of like hidden access users, right? In Office 365, we would call this yeah. like inheritance or like external sharing links. And now the same thing exists in like G Suite Dropbox as well, where, you know, there may be like a link out there and you may not know where it is, right? So the other thing is that um, you've got to compare and contrast that with your user behavior and the needs of the organization so that as you're looking at the software, right, the questions to ask yourself are going to be like, is it easy for users to use? Is it, yes. is it kind of a tool for IT where we're actually just going to have to like, like it makes things a little bit easier, but really what we're going to have to do is learn a whole new interface just to save a few clicks here and there, right? Is it that kind of a tool or does it actually have some AI automation built into it can it actually reduce our workload at the same time as controlling this governance right yeah. does it have any kind of automatic enforcement involved here right is it is it actually yeah. like correcting things that can happen in the environment as well yeah and another conversation i was having with a customer about a month ago uh they were they they support microsoft skype for business right now in an on-premises environment, and they are looking hey. from a unified com unified communications perspective, they're looking at being the support arm for Microsoft Teams, which is a totally different type of engagement. You're going from managing servers, and uh, yes, there is uh, the voice and the video and the traffic, network traffic. You're going from managing that to managing the technology. Now there is some of the same overlap in uh, making sure your network quality is appropriate for ban for the bandwidth controls and all that stuff, but it's a totally different game. And they're looking at it going, you know, we have 80 people managing this Skype for business contract. Am I gonna have to hire another 40 to 80 people to manage the team side of this as well? And so going back to your point, if we're looking for solutions, we want to look for things that provide that automation, that provide the ability uh, to decrease the expected workload of, of information technology, not increase it. Right. So, so if you go back to governance from a planning perspective, if you're designing a plan for provisioning and life cycle of your workspaces, you need to make sure that you have a means to identify programmatically your uh, workspaces that should be expected to be near end of life and a means to confirm with the business owner whether or not that is near end of life. And if it is, a means to then remove the workspace, archive, delete, whatever, without adding all of those steps as workload items to your IT department. Because if you're adding that, you're not you're, you're, yeah, you're keeping your content clean, but you're having to hire more and more people to be able to support it. Yeah, but you know, the other thing about this too, so there's, there's two kind of considerations here. When I, uh, when I get into a conversation about like the ROI of software as a service, one of the things that I tell people is that it's, it's really important to understand where you are reducing the workload of what, you know, managing a server used to be and managing those networks. And we touched on that, on that a little bit more, like you're getting rid of a lot of that hardware time that you used to have to spend, but it's translating now more and more into like training. Right. Right. So like where you used to spend time on networking stuff there, now you're having to, to work with users on training and things. So like, and this could include having to retrain you know, some of those teams that you have even in your IT team to like focus on new stuff, right? So I wouldn't, and not always, especially, you know, these are people that you have relationships with. These are people that have a general knowledge of these things. A lot of times it's not that hard to retrain them to do a move from like Skype teams. You don't have to look at it as, you know, having to have a complete switch from these, look at a transition, have a transition plan from you know, to enable them to to move over because you're not like, for instance, the whole point is something that's not quite as, uh, 
you know, something as new as Teams is in right. the industry and to a lot of organizations, it's going to be a lot harder to find a, that many people that are familiar with Teams management to that level, right? So having them trained specifically to your organization, it's going to be more valuable to you than trying to like shift other people over from different areas in your organization or rehiring for those jobs. And the other thing I would say is that the same thing as we're talking about all this stuff for your end users, understand that going forward, stuff changes much more rapidly now. It just does. Yeah. And the upside of that is organizations get the work from home capabilities that just saved millions of jobs in this economy because people can just work from home and turn it on and they're fine. They're you're using teams kind of stinks being inside of the house all the time. But at the same time, like they didn't have to get let go because they have this ability to work from remote. And for a lot of organizations, it wasn't a crazy painful process to make that happen. Now, um, the, the other side to that, too, is that productivity in general is increasing with these platforms. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, obviously there's a curve there, a learning curve and a pain of transition curve. But after a period of time when people are trained up and they're good to go with a new platform, they're going to be able to do a whole lot more, a whole lot faster, which means organizations can do more with less with the new software that they have. And a lot of times it's even cheaper to do it that way than it was to maintain the stuff they had going on earlier. Now, it's also important to understand that these users, the more training they get, right, the more productivity they're going to get, the more sure. productivity your organization gets. And this is, you know, reference the, the first and second episodes that we did of this uh, podcast series, because, you know, it's so, so important that that's, that's happening. But for you, for IT teams, um, and administrators, that means that you're going to, again, have to understand how your users are working, how you can make their lives easier. And if you want to be their friend, if you want happy end users, if you want to prove your value to organizations, that's what you've got to do. You've got to show them that you're, you're there. You're, you are there, excuse me, you are their friend and that you're here to make their lives easier. Try to make it fun. Try to help them meet as specific uh, use cases as you possibly can with them and show you know, show them the value of what's going on. Because if you don't, and this gets back into yeah. our conversation here, if you don't, what's going to happen is if they don't understand how to use stuff, if they don't understand once you've got the security systems and maybe additional software in place and you've got rules and you've got training, if it's not easy enough, they're going to go to a different platform. They're just going to go over to, you know, if they're in Office 365, they're going to go to G Suite or vice versa, maybe, or like yep. whatever they're familiar with, or the simplest possible thing. There's all sorts of collaboration platforms, email platforms out there. They're just going to go in there and do it, right? And so you've got to make it so easy for them that they don't have to think about it. They don't have to, you know, just go over and use something else because, you know, people have short attention. You know, when you look at marketing, if something takes three clicks versus four clicks, your acceptance You're rate using drops. the three clicks one, yeah. It, it plummets, right? If you go from three to four clicks, there's this huge drop off. They're not very patient. So you need to make it as streamlined as possible, right? Make it a very, sure. very simple thing and have training materials and a continual training plan to get them to understand your security processes as governance is rolled out and keep it in place so that you can continually train them as things go on. Yeah. So you started talking about um, gaining their buy-in. And one of the things that I think's really help that I think really helps with that is understanding what is a governance plan. Um, and, and this is, there's an actual tie-in here. It's not just me trying to move us along. There's an actual tie-in in when you're trying to gain their buy-in and build and build trust with the end user when you build a proper governance plan, it's not something that you're shoving into the back closet and not giving people access to. The governance plan is an open and transparent definition of how should this system be used. From the end user in understanding what the technologies are and why they are there and what benefit they bring, to IT in understanding how to lock things down, by defining this in a single document and making that something that people have access to and then utilizing the tool capabilities to ensure people understand why things work the way they work, you start to build that trust and, and build that relationship. So what I mean by that is, for example, um, in our governance te te technology at AvPoint, uh, we have a questionnaire 
that walks users through um, identifying the business or collecting the business requirements so that we can tell them what technology to use and how to use it. And one of the things our questionnaires do is we have the ability to pop up information. Um, so the, in our standard demo, it's, you know, do you want to share with more or less than 5,000 people? Uh, you know, that's a technological thing. Uh, and then we follow that up with, do you have a workspace for sharing this? And if you do, we pop up a pop-up that says, great, here's a link to how to create a channel within your workspace. We recommend creating a channel. And so the governance plan has a definition of when you use a channel versus a team. And the, and and so it's very clear, it's defined. And then the technology, we actually utilize the technology to tell people why we're making that recommendation and how to be successful with it. Um, so part of that governance plan is making sure you are open and transparent with the end users as to why tech works the way it works. The other thing that you need to remember when you're defining your governance plan, um, and we do this when we when we sell a service to create a governance plan, look at my big air quotes there. The, the reason I use big air quotes there is what we're creating is the first cut, the first draft. It is a living document that will go on in perpetuity. It doesn't matter what technology you use. It doesn't matter who the CIO is. It doesn't matter uh, what end users like or dislike. You need to keep the governance plan updated and living. And the reason for that is as the technology changes, you need to update what, what you're going to control and how you're going to control it and what end users should use for what purpose. Um, when your mission changes, you need to update how the technology supports the mission. <clears throat> and being able to do that together in that living document is, is how you ensure everybody's on the literal same page in how to yep. use your technology safely, effectively, efficiently to get your job done. And give people buy-in for it, right? Yeah. Make them feel like they're part of a team. Understand, like, hey, we're all in this together. You know, if if something happens in the news and there's a security breach, you know, explain it to them. Be like, look, we don't want to be like this. We really appreciate you guys following the rules. And here they are again. And this is why we have them. So we don't wind up, you know, being on the front page of the newspaper the next day because, you know, we take security very seriously. You know, if you were one of our customers, you wouldn't want your information exposed to the wrong kind of people as well. So, like. Yep. Let's all work together to make this happen, you know, getting people to understand that they're part of a team and making that part of your company culture. It works. It really does. Um, and at least gives them the big picture of like what's going on as opposed to, you know, organizations I've worked with in the past uh, that I've worked for, I should say, they just have manual uh, when you get hired on and it just says, don't do this. Uh, you'll be yes. accountable if it happens. And that's all you get. And it's like, no, look, you got to have, um, especially for your teams that do deal with sensitive information, but for everybody on the, the whole organization, look, if you know, this is how it should be done. Um, there needs to be enforcement with it. If you have all of, if you go through three quarters of this stuff and you don't have any kind of, you know, regulations and enforcement, if you don't have software enforcement within the pl platform that kind of has guidelines and rails as to the kind of actions users can or can't take, as well as you know, in the best case scenario, there are some software platforms out there that will actually like correct uh, actions that are incorrect taken by users, uh, things like that. Then all you've got is this living document. And again, it's like that handbook when you first get hired. That's like, don't do this. Man. You yeah. know, and part of the it, I'm not going to try to get too controversial. But if you look at the things that are happening in our society right now, it's a lot of it is the same kind of thing. We can look at paper and say, well, this is the policy. But what's actually happening may be very different from the policy. And if you don't regularly remind people and create a culture of change that takes that policy seriously and people understand why that's necessary, then what you yeah. get is chaos. Yeah. And that actually leads to what I would call my number one governance plan snafu. You know, we talked about making sure it's an, a living document. We talked about getting buy-in. Um, I think the one thing that really gets me is missing the boat with what a governance plan is. Um, I, I've had a number of customers say, here, we, we actually have a governance plan. Uh, we had an, a consultant come in and they developed this for us and they send it over. And it's a list of who owns what services, 
and how should those services be controlled from like a theoretical perspective, but yeah. no actionable steps. And so really all they have is a governance guide, like a, hey, would you mind, you know, when you guys use our system, can you be sure that maybe you remember to delete your space after it's not used for a month? Well, okay, that's great. But how are you actually reinforcing that behavior? How are you, uh, you know, I'm not saying go out there and delete the workspace, the team or the channel or whatever, immediately when that month hits. But do you have a report that tells people their workspace has been inactive? Uh, do you have a report that says, hey, your project ended three months ago. Are you still using this space? Do you still need this content? Is there any kind of regulation that says we have to keep this content for a certain period of time? Um, and, and so that really gets into like my biggest pet peeve with governance plans is, is you spend all this time and money defining who owns it and how they should you know control it, but nothing to actually implement that. No, nothing to say, hey, natively in your system, this is what you can do. And this is where the gaps are, because you know what, when you have that list of gaps, you know now what to target over the next year in third party software buying to make sure you can fill them. Um, or you frankly know what risks you have. And going back to that risk conversation, risk mitigation is not about eliminating risk, but it's making sure that you reduce its likelihood and you have a strategy for you know what to do when the chips hit the fan. Well, what you do is you have to know what the risks are. And if you aren't creating that actionable step, you don't know that there's a risk here that someone's not going to be able to do something. Um, so yeah, just trying to tie all that together. Now, We've been going on for about 30 minutes, 35 minutes on why governance is important. You know, how do you, what do you need to consider at the beginning of doing your plan? What is a governance plan? Um, you know, when we first sat down and had this conversation, you suggested something and I'm like, wait, hold that to the end. And, 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 and that was like, how does an IT professional create all of this stuff, right? How do they make sure it's successful? Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to let you actually talk through that, but I, I feel like this is a good place to put it in, right? We've set all that table and all that importance, but now that we've put like all of this weight on you, like, what do you do next? Yeah, exactly. And this starts, you know, uh, this can go back to the starting point or as you're starting to kind of assess the scenario. Um, and again, this kind of goes back to that same conversation we had a few episodes back of like, look building friends, getting buy-in from stakeholders for your plan. If you do it alone, it's never going to go through, right? So you've got to find people that understand this stuff or people that you can at least get to sit down and have some conversations with you. Uh, if you don't have a lot of people like that in your organization, make some friends, um, make them understand or get them to understand uh, the, the need for having a governance team, okay? Mm -hmm. And start to build that. And that you know, great place to start with that are like legal, security, and compliance teams, um, higher up stakeholders that really understand liability. You know, when you take something to a stakeholder or like a C-level and you make them understand, like, listen, we don't want to be on the front page of the news. And right now I'm seeing that there could be some scenarios where this could happen. Let's work together to get the whole under organization to understand this, right? Because we need to make it happen, um, you know, there's a starting point. Now you are the person that knows your organization. You know sure. the people that are going to be interested in this. You know who you can talk to like that and who you can't talk to like that, hopefully. Um, so don't, this isn't like go take a bunch of risks and just try to, you know, start fires everywhere and make people think that it's an emergency and has to be done. This is start those conversations, right? See who you can get to be on a governance committee. Um, yes. It just popped there's into my head word. that you could just be like, look, there's a new governance committee and we need to get people that, you know, have influence on it. Would you like to be part of it? You know, you don't have to. Sometimes it's that simple, right? Just be like, yeah, uh, if you just I tell everybody the it, other but... person said that you have to do it, then they might just join. So, <laughs> um, no, really, though, but like just having those conversations, people from your cybersecurity legal teams are great places to start because they do have some sway. You know, it's different. If an IT manager in most organizations goes to people and says, hey, we need this, it's a lot different response than if like a lawyer says, hey, this has to happen, you know, very different. Um, you, you definitely want C-levels or people from higher levels of leadership in your organization 
for some organizations that means a C level for some organizations that could be like a VP or somebody a little bit lower. It just depends on the company and how they operate and what that looks like. Um, and you know, you also definitely want some stakeholders and it might be safe even to bring in some like some power users from the field, yes. right? People that you can like trust to be in a higher up meeting, right? You don't just want to pull any old end user in there and just be like, Hey, this is this person, you know, and they start saying crazy stuff, but like definitely the people that you think would be appropriate that can constructively add to those conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, it would be appropriate to have power users or like low level managers and things like that can, that can really kind of communicate, um, what's actually going on in the field, right. Or with, yeah. with collaboration systems. Um, and then, Definitely, you know, yourself or other people from the admin team to kind of back you up to give your your all's perspective and experience towards how things can be managed in the implementation of a governance plan or security plan. And then also a lot uh, of organizations for last. <laughs> a lot of organizations uh, have like a records management team that's separate from all of this, right? Or an information management team. Um, they would also be key uh, to be to be bringing in now. If you are using consultants um, or have used consultants for any part of the implementations, you may want to bring them in uh, to see what they've seen and kind of talk about the things that they've worked with. Um, and maybe even like we're we're from uh, again, we work for a point of software company, but like people will bring us into these conversations and talk about, you know, talk about governance. So don't be afraid to bring in external people that you trust. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't just bring in any old consultant, but like. If there are people in the in the industry that you trust that you feel like can add to the conversation or maybe not make them part of an ongoing panel, but even just like every now and again, just come have them present ideas and highlight importance uh, yep. and things like that for people to understand. Yeah, I would actually go so far as to say you need different types of members. And I don't just mean different roles like you've described, but you need like your core members. Your core members are going to be information technology they're going to be the records and information management team. They're probably going to be a representation from either legal and or cybersecurity. Um, and sometimes there are actual cybersecurity people in legal, which is your ideal scenario. Um, and something from a legal, uh, from a leadership representation. That I think is your core. Um, the, the, the secondary set of people I would look at is your representatives from the business. And the reason I say secondary is because these are people, if you have a 50,000 person organization, having representatives from business is going to be really, really hard to do, right? So what you do is in this secondary level of membership, you actually rotate, you know, bring people in for one, two, three months and have that role rotate quarter to quarter or month to month. I like multiple months in a row because you get that feedback and uh, you get to build a feedback loop with them, but have that rotate because having one end user from one business group be, on the, be the only member from that area for a year means that you're neglecting 49,000 other people in theory, but having some sort of a rotation schedule for, hey, this time we're going to bring someone in from this business unit for this quarter, and then next quarter we're going to bring in some from that business unit. And now what you start to see is little by little, you not only hear from an end user business unit, but now you can start to compare the stories you're hearing and how the, how the technology you've deployed and how you've deployed it affects across the organization. Yeah. And the, and then, the, oops, sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to jump in there. Uh, I would also say, though, too, that this is going to involve all these policies. Uh, you know, this is kind of committee work, conversations and things like mm -hmm. that. Make it diverse. Make it so that yeah. you're able to relate to as many people in the organization as you possibly can and right. make it so that people will understand and and and, you know, bring in different perspectives to the language that you use and to the approaches that you take so that you really can create a healthy living document and a healthy set of policies that doesn't make people feel like, you know, it's some kind of thing being brought down at them, you know? Yep, absolutely. Really important. So uh, I, I think we've thrown a lot out there. Um, we had a, a, some tangential conversations that I think are really valuable, like how do you select a software vendor or a partner to help you? Um, but just to kind of summarize what we talked about, to get started, you need to figure out what do you have, 
What is your inventory um, from policies to procedures to data inventory? Um, you need to understand what do we already have that we can take advantage of. Two, you need to understand what do we need from an end user perspective, from mission success perspective, um, and and combine those things together and start evaluating like what are the gaps in you know we have a policy over here that says you can't do this, but we have end users flat out saying that if we can't do this, they're not going to be successful. So start comparing those things together, then look at your technology and start figuring out a what are we doing right and what are we doing b what are we doing wrong and c what aren't we doing with this technology stack that we have that could help to alleviate some of these issues that we have identified um, once you've gone through that now you can start to figure out how do we what what, what should our plan be what should the, gov the governance plan say um, how do we want to use the technology uh, how do we want to secure the technology? Why do we want to do it that way? What benefits are people going to get from doing all of this? And what are the actionable steps we can take to be successful with it? And, and don't forget, don't do it alone. It, you, you're not going to get far if you do it alone. That governance working group, the governance uh, committee, whatever you want to call it, whatever language makes sense for your organization, ensures that you are building buy-in across the organization um, it ensures that if you spent six months defining a governance plan and implementing that strategy, that leadership doesn't come in and go, why would you do that? That's not why I purchased this tool. It, you, you've got that buy-in. It ensures that end users don't look at what you've done and say, nah, I'm just going to go get Box and uh, upload my files to this FTP server or whatever whatever they do to get around it. It ensures that you're you're building that success. Yeah, so that's um, that's pretty much our podcast for today. Uh, you know, that's, in those are show. most of the main points that exactly that we wanted to touch on for this conversation. Remember that governance doesn't just mean a plan. Uh, you know, in the high level and, and quick summary, it means a, a policy and enforcement, right? Put together yes. as a strategy to help your users do the right thing the right way, so that your organization is number one organized, and number two reducing risk in operation for the long term. So, um, you know, normally, uh, yeah, I mean, I would just say that, you know, if you guys have any differentiating opinions or ways that you disagree and the things that we've said, or if you really like the conversation that we've had and uh, want to contribute to it in some way, definitely feel free to leave some comments under the, uh, the video here or on social media posts. If you have questions, uh, we're happy to ask or let other people, I mean, excuse me, we're happy to answer them or happy to let other people in the industry that may have some direct experience answer them. And please, if you've had experience with these things and want to share um, your experience that you've gone through in creating a government's plan, and that could be the things that maybe happened that weren't so great, or it could be the stuff that you did that you you found was really, really successful, maybe something that we didn't touch on today, um, please leave that feedback in the, uh, in the comments there, in the replies. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for talking, Hunter. Um, and uh, I look forward to our next episode. Yeah, thank you, Jay.